Hi, and welcome to Erie's 8-Bit Workshop. I'm Erie Salmon. We're continuing our build of the TI-9922 today. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, now's a good time to stop and go back and watch them. We've already installed the power circuits, the passives, the ICs, and installed the SDRAM, and we'll be continuing the build today. This is the TMS-9900 CPU. It's the heart of the TI-9922. We'll be installing it today along with the rest of the system ICs, We'll be arranging the power supply and powering it up for the first time. Will it work? Let's find out. So today we're installing the key ICs that bring this board to life, the TMS9900 CPU, video display processor, system ROMs, and support logic. And then we'll do a clean power up, check the voltages, and see if this thing actually breathes. Before we start installing chips, we need to take a quick look at the power supply. We need to assemble it and test it, and also verify that all the soldering we did in the last episode hasn't caused any shorts. The TI9922 has three voltages, 5 volts, 12 volts, and minus 12 volts. Here are two ways to provide those levels. Perhaps the most elegant solution is to use a 12 volt supply feeding into an ATX 12 volt power adapter. The ATX adapter outputs the three voltages we need. The other way is a little simpler and cheaper. That is to use a three voltage mains adapter, and that's the one I've chosen. So here is my power supply from AliExpress. It's been a pretty common form of factor, Many manufacturers seem to have chosen this style, so it should be fairly easy to find a 3D pattern for a power supply box to 3D print. The power cords I have are a 4 core 12 volt cable for the low voltage side and a short extension cable for the main side. I use extension cords for a few reasons. First, I don't seem to be able to purchase black mains cable except by the roll. And secondly, if black was available, the cost of the mains cable from the roll is more expensive than the per meter cost of an extension cord. Lastly, you get a snazzy little molded black piggyback plug already fitted. You just need to cut the socket off the other end. Cut to the outer insulation back and take about two centimeters from the end of each wire. Twist the wire around and then bend into a loop and fit the wire beneath the retaining screw. Be very careful that no stray wires poke out that could cause a short. Let's test the voltage. This unit allows us to tune based on the 5 volt supply. It looks pretty good. Pretty much bang on in fact. Let's check the plus 12 and minus 12. Yep, they look good too. So onto the 22 system board. The easiest way to check we're not going to kill any parts when we power up is to verify we've not bridged any of the power rails. Take your multimeter and put it into continuity mode and then test between the ground and the three power rails. Then between the five volts and the two other power rails and lastly between the plus 12 and minus 12 volts. If there are no beeps, it's a good sign we've not bridged the power rails. As for the remainder of the solder points, there's no shortcut other than to check all the ICs visually for any bridges or using continuity mode on your multimeter and testing adjacent pins. All of ours look good, so it's back to the assembly. This is the TMS9900, a 16-bit microprocessor introduced by Texas Instruments in 1976. It's the same chip used in their TI-990 minicomputers shrunk down for home use. What I noticed immediately looking at the pinout is that while there are 16 data lines, there are only 15 address lines. 
That means it can only address 32K of memory location. However, since each memory location can hold 16 bits or two bytes, that means that the TMS9900 can address 64K of memory, albeit in an unexpected way. Maybe this is a hangover from its mini computer heritage. If you know, please leave a comment. It's a 64 pin chip and unfortunately obtaining sockets of that size is very difficult. I really don't like soldering ICs where I don't have to. So I have cut two 40 pin sockets to make a 64 pin socket. Now it drops right into this DIY socket. Just line up the, the notch on the silk screen, press gently and we're good. Next, we also drop in key logic chips like the address decoder, the weight state generator and the glue logic for the memory control. Check for bent pins before inserting vintage ICs. I use a Lego liner that I 3D printed. I'll put the link to the STL file in the show notes. Be sure to ground yourself. The SD can damage these vintage chips. I'm using the ground provided by my bench power supply. With the CPU in, we need to load the machine's brains, the system ROMs. These go in here, but first we need to program them. Dan has thoughtfully provided the images for this. Let's take a quick look on how to program them. I have a cheap TL866 programmer, and I use MiniPro to interact with it. Top tip, you can actually use the programmer to test if your 74 series logic chips work. If you'd like me to do a short video on how to do that, let me know in the comments. OK, so here is the command. First, we're going to program the 27C010 IC with extended BASIC. Now the 27C64 with the OS, low bytes and high bytes. Next up is the video chip, the TMS 9918A VDP. This handles all the graphics for the TI-99 series and outputs composite video directly. It works in tandem with the 16K of dedicated video RAM. Before powering on, let's double check everything. We've already checked the power rails are clean and there are no solder bridges. So are the sockets seated properly? Any backwards chips? Yes, we're looking good and ready for the power on. I've attached some DuPont cables to case mount RCA sockets for the video out and audio out. I've also made a reset switch and a power LED. When you're attaching the RCA sockets, it's important to get the polarity right. Here's a tip for you. Put your multimeter into continuity mode and test which pin goes to ground. So we need to have ground on the right on this one and ground on the left on this one. Ground goes to the outer shield. I'll leave the power LED off for the moment. I'm going to attach the RCAs to the input of my OSSC. Let's just do a quick review of the jumper settings. I've set SW2 to not, no contact. Although we've got an X basic ROM in there, we're going to need the unicorn port populated in order to use it. The ROM selects on OS low and OS high are there to select whether the high bank or low bank of memory has been used. We've only populated the low bank when we flash this. And this is to do with the clock setting on the sound. I guess we'll find out more about that later, but it's probably not critical when we're trying to get this thing to boot. The last point is the dip switch settings. I've set each of these to on. This selects whether we have the memory fully populated and we wish to use it all. And we're now ready to go. Let's see if it works. And nothing. We have a power LED. We have nothing on the monitor. If nothing happens, don't panic. It's pretty normal for early builds to need some debugging. 
Okay, let's use the oscilloscope and have a little probe around. Troubleshooting a no-boot situation usually comes down to three areas, clock signals, ROM reads and video output. The clocks are on 8 and 9. Okay, that's a good clock and that's a good clock and 25 and 28. 25 looks good and 28 looks good. Okay, so we're getting a clock. The next thing is whether we're getting activity on the address lines and the data lines. These are the address lines. Address. So all of the address lines look like they've got good data on them. Hmm, those look okay as well. Let's move over to the VDP. Well, we've certainly got activity on these lines, but the transitions are very fast. I apologise, I've got no way of showing the video as it's coming through from the oscilloscope. I'll put in some screen captures. That one looks a bit funky. That would be on CD0. Again, that looks just weird. Okay, that's the video out. And that looks pretty good. I wonder what the actual video out looks like. Let me take the... RCA off for a second and probe that one. Oh, that looks odd. Okay, so it looks like maybe we have a problem between the VDP and the composite pin. We've got some slopes in it, which would indicate that something's not quite right in this area. Okay, well, I found a problem right here. After a bit of uh, detective work, I figured out that the slopes were perhaps caused to an incorrect resistor value, and it looks like I've certainly put the wrong ones in. As you can see, these are probably not the right ones. We need a 75 ohm resistor, and this is a 7.5K, and this one is as well. So let's get those swapped out. Okay, that's still not working. I'm going to have to finish off this video without having the board booted. If anyone's got any advice on where to look next for this problem, um, please leave it in the comments below. Um, I think that the signals that I'm getting into the VDP are not very good. Um, I'm certainly going to do a lot more investigation around this area here. We've now got the key components installed and we've attempted our first power on. If your board boots, well done, that's amazing. Great job. If not, no stress. Debugging is half the fun. I'm going to go and double check my component values and look at those weird signals coming out of the VDP. In the next episode, we're going to talk about how the TR9922 replaces the rare Grom chips for the Clever Modern Solution, and we'll assemble and connect the keyboard. We'll walk through testing basic and loading programs. I hope you're enjoying this series. Please give it a thumbs up, like and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next step. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. I'd also like to hear if you've attempted to build one of these things, or if you remember using the TI-99-4A back in the day. So, thank you for joining me on Aries 8-Bit Workshop. See you next time. Goodbye.